So, yeah, bringing this back to the basketball, is there any analytic or stat that you guys, from watching basketball or from following it, that you think is kind of like the most telling? I think it depends on the position. Um, but I'm always curious as to a, a main ball handler's assist to turnover ratio or a team's assist to turnover ratio. For, like The main reason is how, how free-flowing is your offense? Because if it's stagnant, i.e. Rockets offense from... It's not only stagnant, but it's very like predictable. You know James Harden's going to get the ball top of the key. He's going to create. Um, is that an effective way, or is it the complete opposite side? Golden State, heavy passing, heavy sets. Every trip down the floor, everyone is, is in a role. They know where they're supposed to be, and they're operating kind of free. Like, which, which side is is better, which one leads to more championships. Uh, I think it's, it's just te- which one's better to be tested. Um, so I look at that a lot just to see, like, okay, well, how is the team playing together? Because I feel like when it's more free-flowing, I think, and everyone gets to touch the ball, uh, everyone's more confident. And then that's when you can see, like, the random 10th uh, man on the bench can light you up for nine to 12 because he's, he's touched the ball. It's not like he's shooting the ball for the first time in the game when you give him the ball and like you're telling him to create, but it's, it's operating within the offense. I think that's telling. Um, that's probably my most, the most interesting stat that I see from teams. Yeah. I think that kind of ties into something that I remember. Um, and Adrian, I, I'm guessing that you were there. I'm pretty sure you were there when one of our former professors siblings came to mm-hmm. came to talk to us at UCF and uh he works for an NBA team. I'm not gonna mention which team or anything, but we know. um yeah, we know. And he uh I remember him telling us that they that team has a specific analytical model to evaluate players based on their fit within their system and within the like how they would do with the stars that are already on that team and it was like and i I remember him showing it to us and it literally said like okay this is the you know these these two are the star players and like so and so you know kevin durant or something would be an amazing fit on this team or like jimmy butler would be an amazing fit on this team and it was like they that's how they attacked you know, trade deadline. That's how they attack uh, free agency and the draft, like trying to find players that fit very specifically within that skill set. Um, and it was it was very impressive to me because I was like, it, it takes a, a deeper level of analytics to know, you know, like because any player theoretically, right, You any player has the talent. If they make it to the NBA, they should have the talent. Oh, they have to, the talent, absolutely. To be good. They're but, gonna cook me any day of the week for sure. Yeah, but you know, and and Ricky always likes to you know bash on your boy LeBron, and um, I think that's something that you kind of saw when LeBron first went to the Heat is the chemistry was not fully there. It took a little bit of time to develop. That's why you know they didn't like everyone just assumed when the big three joined up in Miami that they would just win. You know, and it's like yep. yeah. It was like it was a foregone conclusion. It's like I, I'm I wasn't into betting at the time, but I'm guessing that there was a you know that they were almost a like minus odds that they would win the championship once the three of them teamed up. And it's like no, you know, like cool. There's three of the best players in the league at that time, but it takes first off, it takes additional role players to be there. And it takes, you know, that chemistry. And you saw it in that first series. I believe they lost to, was it the Dallas. Um, the Mavericks? Yeah. And, you know, that team had Dirk and those guys had been together for a long time. And, you know, they knew exactly how they were operating and stuff. And then 
I believe the third one they lost to uh, the, the Spurs. Was it the Spurs? And yeah, another team that you know those guys, Tony Parker, um, Tim Duncan, they had played together for years and years and years. So um, I think that chemistry aspect of it and knowing how your teammates are going to function uh, can change, like can make a huge difference on your, you know, how successful your team's going to be on the offensive side. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting, right, where you have analytics that back why we have the players and why the pieces could fit. And then there's this, the next part of it, where is, do you have the scheme? Um, do they have the confidence? Do they, um, is there continuity? Uh, and on a team sport, there's like this underlying just like, what is team chemistry, right? It's like knowing where you're supposed to be before you have to be there because you're on the same wavelength, you're connected. Um, and if you don't have that missing piece, you can have a great, an all-time great team, but the team may not go far, farther than a team that really knows each other. Then a team that really knows each other with all-time talent, that's a really tough team. Um, which I think analytics, do you think analytics can, can get you all the way there? Or do you think there's like, or, or what do you think the percentage is? Like, do you think it's like 70% can get you there with analytics? Do you think you can get there to like 90% with analytics alone? In like, in a vacuum, like, with, like what is that, that um, not like magical formula, but what do you think that number is where you can rely on? That's tough. Um, me personally, I think, I think analytics can get you a lot of the way there. I, I would say, I'd say 75%. You know, I was thinking I think 75, it's, yeah. I think it's three quarters of the way there. And I think some good things that come with analytics, right? Analytics takes out human bias. Um, I don't know if I've told this story on, on the podcast before. If I did, then sorry for people who have to listen to it again. But there was a, a story that I read about how the Rockets didn't draft Paul Gasol. For one reason, and one reason only. They had a, because that was back when Daryl Morey was on the Rockets. He had an entire analytical system to find the best players. And it said Paul Gasol was going to be a star in the NBA. And he, like, told everyone that, like, he's like, guys, we need to draft Paul Gasol. We need to draft Paul Gasol. And they didn't because one person said that Paul Gasol's nickname was Man Boobs. And... That circled around the entire draft room, and they didn't draft him because, like, they were worried about the scrutiny of taking a guy who's not the best athletically gifted person, and they didn't draft him. He went on to be an incredible player for probably 10 plus years. And it's like, okay, you, the analytics told you that that was going to be the best player, and you ignored them, and you went with human bias, you then missed out. So I think. You know, I think taking out that human bias, I think that's why I really think 75%. Because, and also, too, there's so many examples of, like, if players really can buy into analytics and use them properly and be taught how to use them properly if they don't already know. Um, another example is I was reading something about Shane Battier. He used to play in the NBA for a while, and he actually worked for the Heat afterwards. Uh, in their analytics department, he explained that in 2008, when he played against the Lakers, the Lakers had a .98 points per possession. So almost one point per possession. That that Lakers team was probably nasty, you know, and like they were really good. And Kobe Bryant was shooting, when he shot the left-handed pull-up jumper, he was shooting it at a 44% clip. So 44% times it being a two-pointer, that's .88 points per possession. So he knew every time that he was guarding Kobe Bryant, he wanted to make him shoot that shot because it was less points per possession than what the Lakers team in the, as a whole was averaging. So it's like that's something that's so intricate, that's so Absolutely. Like needing to study the, the team and the people you're going up against. But it can make such a big difference because .1 points per possession doesn't sound like a lot, but when there's 100 and 
20 possessions in a game or 150 possessions in a game, that's, you know, that's 15 averages. points. Yeah. That's 15 points. You're going crazy there. Um, but, yeah, what about you? I mean, I know you said uh, 75% as well. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, and it's for that exact reason, right? Because um, take any given game, right, where you're in the NBA, you got here for a reason, anyone can go off for 25 to 30. It's just I, – I firmly believe that. On a good yeah. night, anyone can get 30. Um, but – that's where analytics come into play, where you want to, you can systematically choose via your scheme and analytics who you would like to get 30. So if you look at that first Golden State team that played LeBron in the finals and LeBron was down, Kevin Love and Kyrie, their whole game plan was we can let LeBron score every point, or we can get rid of the help. They made a choice. Now, LeBron still averaged, like, what, 20, like, 30 and something? Like, sure. LeBron numbers. But because there wasn't a second guy that was giving him 24, you, you now have a shooter's chance, even though he took him to a very tough six himself. A year later, LeBron has Kyrie. They battle back from 3-1 down. It's 3-1. What's the game plan? You know Steph Curry is electric. You know Klay Thompson is electric. Who do you force in that situation? What is the game plan? You know that they're going to take X amount of threes a game. You, But you also know if... Uh, you can't guard three guys. You can only double one guy at a time. Do you force the ball to a Clay Thompson? Do you force the ball to Steph Curry? Via, your, via their research, they can decide, okay, based on what we're going to do, we're going to execute on this and hope this sticks. When people say, like, we had a great, uh, had a great game plan, I always wondered what that meant. And they just focused on, we're just going to let this person get 40. Because we know that the others, if we, if we can restrict their confidence to shoot, and they get five, well, on a 10-man, 10, 10 to 12-man team, you have five points, from, five points each from 10 guys, that's 50 points, and one guy gets you 30. Well, that's 80 points. I think as a team, we can get to 96. Well, you just won the game. Focusing on one guy allowing him to get 40. Get hot. Great. You shoot. Have a blast. No one else is scoring. Them. We're making sure we're taking everybody else away. So I think analytics can get you definitely 75% of the way there. Um, and then the rest of it, I think, is chemistry, talent. Um, and I, I, with all sports, you need a little bit of luck. You need luck. Um, whether it's one person you didn't think to get hot gets hot, i.e. This is probably my favorite LeBron story ever. It, it was Gilbert Arenas is at, at the free throw line. He could ice the game. And apparently they played cards back in the day or something um, with, with Dante Jones. And the whole joke that LeBron gave to him at the free throw line was, hey, you know if you miss this shot, you know it's going to end the series, right? You know it's going to end the game. And no one knew what that meant until Gilbert came out and told this story like uh, maybe a year ago, a couple months ago on his podcast where he's like, we used to play cards. It was me, LeBron, Dante Jones. And I knew exactly who he was talking about. And I was like, Dante Jones hasn't even played this game. Like, he hasn't, he's done nothing. So you, what do you mean if I miss this shot, Dante's going to – but via the analytics, they knew they're not going to let LeBron shoot this ball. So who would, if they're bringing help, they know that someone's going to be open. LeBron is top three in terms of passers in the game ever. He's getting the ball to Dante Jones in the corner, and what does Dante Jones do? He hits the highest percentage shot on the court, ends the game. Craziness. Like, best play, analytics says that that's the best shot. He's the most ready to take that shot. Kobe would just took the shot. Completely understand that. 
but the best analytical play would have been get the ball to the weak side corner where he's wide open. He's n- no one's going to be able to close out in time. No one's anticipating a clo- this pass to be made or even caught. But that's practice and chemistry, knowing I can get you the ball there, be ready to shoot. He shot it, end of the game. Gilbert's now like, damn, I just lost the game. I, I should have just hit two free throws. Um, but I think that's really impressive, where it's like analytics meets talent. Like, if it was any other person, could they have made that pass? Maybe. I know LeBron can. Um, but that's like that next level where analysts can get to the corner, but you have to have talent to get it there. Yep. Ricky, welcome back. Um, Spectrum you missed- got me again, man. Spectrum got me again. But, uh, I, you know, Tough. I, I, I imagine you guys held it down and Adrian, you know, giving some great analysis as well as you, Sean. So do you guys go into like the future of analytics in, in the NBA? What do you, what do you think that's going to, where that you think that's going to go? We didn't, but we can go there. Um, I just think the game either does one of two, like it, I think it's just going to speed up and players are going to have, are going to catch up to that. I.e. we went through a big man stage and then it became a small guys, like a guard game. Now you have Victor who is seven God, seven, two, seven, three, hmm. who moves like Kevin Durant, who can block shots like Joel and and Anthony Davis. Like, he's a walking 30 and 15. How are you going to compete with that? How can, size-wise, who can move, who can guard one through five because he's agile? He's not, like, heavy set. So, if the game is moving to more analytics, now you're going to see big guys that are dominant, now size kills. Size and speed, it, it's going to be insane what these, what these games are going to be. Um, it's going to be hard to stop. I don't think defense is, is, is going to be able to keep up. Unless you change the rules somehow. Because it's, it's going to be it's going to be scary hours. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. And I think, you know, I think people are going to need to find a way to be smarter. Right, because it's like if you're a player who's not seven foot and like the Victor guy, you know, or like someone who's athletically dominant, you're going to need to find a way to just be smarter than everyone else on the court. And that's kind of you know the mindset is going to have to be you know you're going to need to find either people that are very 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 athletically gifted that also have you know they have to be at least somewhat strong minded, you know, like. You see what happens when people are kind of weak-minded and they end up kind of fizzling out. Um, So you need to have someone strong-minded. But then the people who aren't athletically gifted, they're going to need to be crafty. They're going to need to find ways to either put their put their teammates in the best position. Like, and you see that a lot with the ball movement and how that's made a big impact on now it's NBA, where it's big with three pointers. You know, you move the ball enough times, eventually you get to the open person. So. Um, I think that's going to continue. Um, and you know, it's just going to need to be, people are going to need to find a way to, to put themselves or their teammates in the best position to score, as opposed to, you know, the one guy who's like, oh, I'm going to do it all myself. That's, it's just not going to work like that. You know, like, and it hasn't worked like that for a while. That's why these super teams became a thing is because one guy really doesn't do it by himself anymore. He does like, I think the closest thing to doing it by himself was, you know, Giannis when he took that team. But he had he still had, you know, solid team. Around star. Super, it wasn't a super team in my opinion, but he I would agree with you. That's the closest guy that's kind of took it on his shoulders. Main the main main man status. Granted, that, he still had all stars yeah. on his team. He had Chris Middleton averaging probably what twenty something a game. Yeah, but I think so, that's, that, that's not I think a, a lot of times these these super teams are like Hall of Fame. You could be Hall of Fame caliber. To me, that's more of a super team than a guy that's a borderline all star, which I think is is more of um, Chris Middleton and and Drew Holiday. Yep, I would agree. Um, what about you, Ricky? Where do I see the game going? Um, I was going to actually pose a question to both of you. Like, if guys' range is if they're shooting damn near from half court, do you think they should introduce a four point line? Yeah. No. Yeah. I came to see, in my opinion, I'm 
if I wanted to go and see the Harlem Globetrotters, I would go and see the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> and that's... Uh, how else can I explain this? It, it would probably be like... The game of basketball is the game of basketball, and I want to see basketball being played. If, because we have this four-point line, we have we increased to a six-man game, because I just don't... that There's just so much space. There's going to be... There's no way defense can keep up if you're shooting from half court and you're making them consistently. If that's the case, like there's no defense. Like you can't guard that because the moment you have to step up to two to double team on a four point line at half court, that's layups every day. That's lob city for every team. Now, if that's it, if that's good, then great. But I, uh, I'm okay. I think two things. One, you know, as you get these more athletically gifted people like a Victor, um, yeah, you know, they're going to be able to to guard further out because they can guard anyone. They can guard anyone anywhere on the floor. Um, Granted, not, you know, still not saying they should go out and guard someone at half court, but um, I think you need to reward, like, special talent and i think shooting from half court or something like that if you can consistently make that shot that's special talent to me that's you're you're not you're unreal if you're doing that like i can shoot a half court shot i'm gonna make it one out of every 20 times so that's not a shot that i'm gonna take maybe steph can make it you know steph or dame or someone else can make it one out of every five but um, I think you just need to reward. If they're going to take that risk of shooting from that far out, give them an extra point. Sure. I think it's worth it. I, I may side more with Adrian on this one, um, but I would say this, though. If they did have a four-point line, you know, I think that maybe, you know, I was thinking back to how people may have felt when, a three-point line was introduced, and they may have been saying the same things that we're saying here. When we say four-point line, I don't think it has to be, like, half court. It could be, you know, uh, maybe... Like 30, probably like 30 feet, 30, 32 yeah, feet. Yeah, 30, 32 feet, maybe. Like right you know, it's going to be hard line. for the... It's going to be hard for the corners because you might have to expand the out-of-bounds line because you're going to be getting really close to stepping out-of-bounds, potentially. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I would want that in the game, but, like I said, people may have not wanted three-point line back in the day, and... But I do see it from Sean's side as well, and um, you know, making it, uh, you know, rewarding these guys for the distance from which they're shooting because there's no reason for them to be shooting from as far as they are. But it's, I mean, we find it entertaining, so why not put a line out there? I, I definitely think people, when the three point line was introduced, were probably against it. They were like, "Well, no, this is going to make it too spaced out. You know, like mm-hmm. it's going to make the big men obsolete," which it did. Down down the line, it. You know, we we talked about it earlier. It did. You know, you don't see the big guys who can't move very well because there's a three-point line. I think a four-point line would do the same thing, but it's exciting. If people want to see people want to see craziness. So, adding a four-point line is craziness. So oh, yeah. that's why I think it could happen. I mean, and maybe should. Uh, and I'll caveat mine by saying, like, hey. I can be wrong because I was wrong about the play in. I didn't want the play in tournament. I thought it was dumb. I'm sure you love it and now. I love the play in tournament now. I think it's, mm. it, it, well, for two reasons. It made what's happening in the West, like the playoffs are started after All Star break because they're separated by a game or two. So if you go on a three game losing streak, you're out the playoffs. You go on a three-game win streak, you're up three or four spots. I think that's exciting. It added like a, a new element, um, a new in-season element to the back half of the season, to where those that got off to a really hot start, you had Memphis, you had Sacramento. What a come up for Sacramento! Like they they never sniffed the playoffs for the past five, ten years, but because of the way that they started, and even at the tail end of last year, they could have snuck into the playoffs. If, this year, they're now being rewarded for having a great start by not having to be in this situation where every game you have to win. 
Like the, every team that's from six to twelve has to win every game, and even if you win every game, you might not get into the playoffs. So I think that's a, it's a much more exciting um, dynamic. Uh, so maybe the four point line is what we need to get to, and maybe I'm just thinking about it way too rigidly, and I'm being old, and maybe we just have to throw it in there, and then the game will evolve again. Um, in the way that like three and D guys are going to be even more important because if you or I guess four and D guys, guys that can hit a four point shot but also <laughs> defend half court, like that's going to be a guy that's like okay, that's the new Danny Green. I can hit some corner threes, or I, I can hit some corner four. I guess you won't have any corner fours. I can hit some like wings on um, four point plays, four point threes, and also defend at a really high level. Like you earned your spot in the league now. Because we need those guys to, to fill out our roster. And if you're a star player, now from the basket to half court, I'm deadly. That's going to raise a new question on, like, the best player in that era, are they the best player ever? I don't know. I Maybe. It's and hard. The other, the other thing, too, let's say you're down 12 points. If there's a four-point line, that's... That's three, three shots. That's three shots, three possessions. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if you get fouled with a five point play. Yeah, that's that's two that'd buckets and you're back in it. That's gonna be that'd be so deflating if I was on the other team. I like led the entire game and then it came down to two shots, which now I'm gonna say it's gonna be all luck. Ah, uh, you didn't practice those shots. Those are that's luck. You gotta, or here what we could do. What if for those shots it has to be a swish? There's backboard. It's a three point. I think that's fair. Uh, now that's to me, that's getting more Harlem Globetrottery. Like I don't know the back. That's versus, true. Which... But if if you hit back where everyone knows you didn't call it, so unless unless they call it in the air and they say backboard, maybe I'll give it to them. Maybe that's fair. <laughs> so yeah, did you guys have any other thoughts about like the future of analytics in the NBA, where it's going to go, or um, any other thoughts on analytics in the NBA today? Yeah, I think um, while analytics has been strictly for the game, I think we're going to see a lot more analytics around um, preparation um, and around recovery. I think recovery of athletes is going to is, is going to be paramount for these next five to ten years because we've seen an influx of injuries like we have never seen due to the speed of the NBA. Um, mm-hmm. And can we reduce some of the ACL tears, the MCL tears, the non-contact injuries, um, the hamstrings, the banged knees? Um, can we reduce those due to analytics in, in the recovery side? I think that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, playing off of that a little bit, um, you know, an- analytics and technology in general, right? Um, using it as a tool to evaluate players. Um, I know something that I believe they've tried to evaluate, or maybe they, they do, is, you know, like, and I know they do it for quarterbacks. It's like how fast your release is. Like, can they measure that for basketball players? How quick, you know, can you get the shot up? Like, that's something that I think technology could play a part in and, you know, potentially our technology play a part in because it's something that can be, you know, used in that kind of a setting a little bit better than than some of our competitors um and i i kind of see that as the future as well just you know getting more information about players and about their like their talent um and you know and also their health metrics i think that those two things are going to be really important going forward i think the future is us extropian uh it's funny i was talking to a guy that was working with the orlando magic he was working um at Orlando, uh, wasn't Orlando Health. He was working at Advent Health, and he was doing some type of, uh, you know, sports medicine, like you know, kind of tracking the athletes, um, you know, oxygen level and things like that, hydration. And uh, he was telling me that they would have to come to the, you know, to their center to evaluate those things. So he said he would go there on game day, and he would kind of, um, you know test the athletes in their training and everything. 
But what what they were doing, what he was finding out, was many of them were like going into the games like super dehydrated for one. But you know, I told him a little bit about what we we're working on. We had like a good conversation. He's like, "Man, what you what you guys are do gonna bring to the game um, is what we were trying to do in our facility with like various pieces of equipment." So I was like, "He was like, man, you bring this to the game. It's gonna it's gonna be a game changer because a lot of the things that we we're finding out about these athletes, um, they weren't they weren't privy to on game day or in training." You know, which could lead to the, you know, the hamstring pulls, the the ACLs, the non-contact injuries, soft tissue injuries, they call them these days. So, you know, we're definitely the future. I think the future, too, is connecting fans and with their favorite athletes in a way they haven't been connected before. Um, and obviously, you got all everybody on here knows. And, you know, our audience will know in the future, like, what that means from our perspective. But I think we're going to be able to do that. I know we're going to be able to do that in a way that nobody else has. So just feeling connected in, in a way that you never have to, to your favorite um, player, your favorite fighter, your favorite uh, athlete. I think we're going to really bring that to the forefront. And that's going to be really incredible because the one thing is you want to, you know, you want people to be more invested in actually attending the games, but also you want to incentivize people for watching at home. And I think we have a lot of amazing tricks up our sleeve on how we plan on doing that. So obviously, you know, with all that being said, you know, we love talking about data. We love talking about analysts because that's what we do, you know, and we, while we love what's out there right now, we think we have, you know, we're taking things a step further and uh, we're going to be that game changer that, uh, you know, people might be talking about us on the podcast about what we've done for the game. So we look forward to that. So that's where we work hard. That's where we grind. That's where we go through these, uh, these ups and downs that we go through and you guys will see that uh when we finally reveal everything that damn this is this is incredible it's gonna change the game and it's it's always incredible too talking to people because anybody you talk to they have their respective sport they love and they can see man i can see you guys this product being used there you know it just it doesn't even matter from f1 to ballet I've, i've heard everybody say man i would use that if i if i had that in my respective sport or my respective hobby so we're excited about it, and uh, that's why we love talking about all these different sports because, um, you know, data is the future. Data is uh, going to help everybody, even every all of the, uh, you know, anybody running on uh, at home or anything. And, you know, the weekend warriors, data is there to uh, make us all better, and uh, we're going to be on the forefront of that, so we're excited. So with that being said, you know, as always, we want you guys to chime in, um, you know, subscribe, like, comment. Um, also, you know, share our podcast with anybody else that's into technology, into being the best version of themselves, into, uh, you know, trying to find out what we're building. You know, we're very secretive about that, but, you know, um, we want to build the hype and build the momentum and just un- unleash on the on the world this amazing product. So that being said, you know, I hope you guys have another excellent week and, uh, you know, we're built different and we want to help build others different. So thank you for joining us again. And thank you, Adrian, for hopping on with us today. We want to have you back on again. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Peace out, everybody. Take care. Peace.